Morning again. Please keep your Bibles uh, open there. I want to begin with a question. And the question is this. Why do you go to church? All right. Now, I don't want you to yell out your answers, but I want to give you a moment to think about it. All right. Why do you go to church? Now, some of you might be thinking, it's because I'm a Christian I go to church. But as a Christian, why do you go to church? Now, some of you will have very spiritual reasons for that. I go to worship. Uh, I go to hear a sermon. I want to learn something. Uh, some of you might be thinking, well, I want to see my friends. Some of you might be thinking, well, I haven't been for a few weeks. Uh, maybe you just like church. That's why you go. You just, you just like it. For some of you, you, you might go to church because you always have gone to church. Some of you, because you feel like you have to go to church and you feel guilty if you don't. Why do you, as a Christian, go to church? And may I ask a follow-up question? What's the point of you being there? What's the point of you being there? Uh, is it so that, you know, Will and Rob have someone to preach to? Uh, is it to make up numbers? What's the point of you actually being at church? Now, I'm going to ask this follow-up question to that. What would happen if you miss church on a Sunday? What would happen at church? What would the consequences have been if you miss church for a Sunday? Would it have changed a thing at church? In this third talk on church, I want to think about me, you as an individual, and what you as an individual, what your place is in your church. And uh, I want to have a look more closely at this passage from Ephesians chapter 4. And let me begin at verse 1 again. Ephesians 4, verse 1, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Now, verse 1 acts like a heading for this passage. Um, uh, it introduces us to what this passage is about. Actually, I think it introduces us to what the rest of Ephesians is about. But for now, this passage, and it's about living a life worthy of the calling you have received. The calling you have received uh, is a way of describing God's uh, choosing you and saving you from Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. In other words, what he's saying is, you have already been saved. Now live a life that is worthy of being saved by God. It doesn't make you worthy, but live a life, of a, live a life worthy of being saved by God. What follows in the rest of this passage is how you live a life worthy of your calling, of God saving you. And the first thing, the very first thing he goes to in terms of living a worthy life is how to get on with people. Now remember from yesterday, it's chapter 2 and 3, he's just talked about how the Jews and the Gentiles who hated each other come together in Christ and are saved together in Christ and now make one church. So you've got this church of all nations, different cultures, different backgrounds, but all one in Christ. And so the first thing he goes to when he talks about living a worthy life of the calling you have received is how to get on with other people. Look with me at verse 3 of Ephesians 4, verse 3. 
He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit. Now notice here that he talks about keeping the unity of the Spirit. Because remember, he's just talked about how Jews and Gentiles are one together in Christ. And so verse 4, he says there's one body and one spirit. There's not a, a, a Jewish Christian's body and a Gentile Christian's body. One, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit going on. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. No guessing what the theme is there for Jews and Gentiles. Oneness. All Christians, all people in Christ are already one in the Lord Jesus. Which is why in verse 3 he says, Make every effort to keep the unity that you already have because of the Lord Jesus. So how do they keep and how do we keep the unity that we already have when everyone is so different? Verse 2, look what he says, verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now let's just drill down in those things for a little bit. Be completely humble and gentle. Being humble is simply not being proud. What's not being proud? It's considering others more important than yourself. It doesn't mean they are, but you treat them as though they are more important than yourself. It's considering their interests before your own. Go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, uh, that explains that. It says, be gentle with one another. Be gentle. Now, what is gentleness? First thing I want to say is gentleness is not weakness. It's never weakness in the Bible. Gentleness is controlled power. Controlled power. What do I mean? Well, it means things like being kind when you could crush. You have the power to crush, but you'd be kind instead. It's being loving when you could lash out. It's being sensitive when you could sting. Controlled power. See, it's not for weak people. I'll tell you what weak people do. Weak people cannot control their emotions. Weak people cannot control their anger. Weak people cannot control their words and how they deliver their words. Anyone can just shoot their mouth off. Anyone can lose their temper. That doesn't take any control. Self-control. It takes strength to control your behaviour. It takes strength to control your words. Gentleness is controlled power. Stopping you from doing something harsh and abrasive and being kind and sensitive, gentle. That takes strength. And so if you are completely humble... And completely gentle with people, you can see how that's good for unity, can't you? If you're harsh and abrasive and arrogant, you know what's going to happen in your relationship with people, don't you? Be completely humble and gentle. Verse 2 also says, be patient, bearing with one another. Now let's be honest. <laughs> Amongst Christian people, there are some who are just quite simply annoying. Yes? Don't look at others. <laughs> there are some people that just get on your nerves. There are some people you just can't stand. There are stubborn people and pushy people and cranky people and selfish people and disagreeable people. And let's face it, there are just some downright unlovable prickly people out there, aren't there? Maybe even in here. <laughs> Maybe standing up the front. Maybe sitting in your seat. What do we do with them? 
What do we do with them? And I can tell you, when the Jews and the Gentiles came together, there was plenty of unlovable people and unlikable people. Do we avoid them? Do we ignore them? Do we, well, can we get rid of them, maybe? No. Verse 2, we are to be patient. Bearing with one another. In a nutshell, what does it mean? Put up with people. Put up with people. It means being understanding and gracious with the faults and the shortcomings and the mistakes and the dislikability of others. But it also means not doing it in a grumpy kind of suki suki la la way. You notice it says, bear with one another in love. In love. That means don't merely tolerate tricky people, but to actively love them. Now, did you notice that this passage actually assumes that within the body of Christ, there will be people who, uh, who you dislike or who are difficult or who are different? If there weren't, then you wouldn't need to be patient, would you? You wouldn't need to bear with other people if everyone was likeable. And that's why it says in verse 3 to make every effort. Because it's hard. It will take every effort to love those who are difficult to love. And let's be real, if there weren't difficult people in the church, quite frankly, the church would be empty, wouldn't it? What the Bible is telling us here is that where unity is concerned in the church, it's not the differences that are the main concern. It's the way we handle them. That's how unity is maintained. That's how unity is kept. It is not kept by sameness, but by how we treat one another. So... That's actually the first kind of unity that it talks about in the Christian church, this unity that we have in Jesus already. And that unity is maintained by treating each other well. Patience, gentleness, humility. But this passage also talks about another kind of unity in the church. And this is a unity that we do not have yet. What's he talking about? I'm at point three in your outline. Let me uh, read with me, uh, uh, if you put your eyes <laughs> on verse 7 of chapter 4, verse 7. says this, But to each one of us, grace has been given as, a as Christ apportioned it. What he means here is that Jesus is the one who gives and distributes grace. Now, grace here is not referring to his death on the cross for us. Grace here is referring to the uh, abilities or the gifts that are needed in the life of the body of the church. Okay, that's what grace means here. And it says here that Jesus gives, that is, gives gifts and abilities uh, for the life of the church to each one of us. And to each one of us, he gives different gifts. He apportions it out differently. Now, in verse 8 to 10, I'm not going to read that now. Uh, verse 8 to 10, he explains why Jesus has the authority to give gifts. Uh, verse 8 refers to uh, an Old Testament verse, Psalm 68, verse 18, about the triumphant Lord. And the point is that um, a, trump, a triumphant king has the authority to distribute his wealth amongst his people. Verse 9 and 10 tells us that Jesus is the triumphant king because he has ascended to the right hand of God in heaven, having first descended into the death that paid for our sins. That makes him the triumphant king. Therefore, he has the authority to distribute uh, gifts. If you want me to explain that more to you, come to me after. Uh, but the point I want to make is that Jesus has the authority to give gifts to his church and so he does that. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, So, because Jesus has the authority, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers 
Uh, so here we see some of the gifts that Jesus gives to his church. Not all of them, but some of them. And what you notice here is that these particular gifts are all people. There's apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. These people are God's gifts to the church. In other words, your pastors are God's gift to you. Will, Rob, they are God's gift to you. You might be saying, can we return them? No, you can't. <laughs> because they're God's gift to you and God only gives good gifts to his church. Uh, so they are God's good gift to you. So be careful here. You treat your pastors. Uh, and they didn't ask me to say that, by the way, though they can pay me later. Um, now, why, does, why, does, why are these particular gifts mentioned here, these particular people gifts mentioned here? It's because these particular people gifts have a particular function in the church, a particular role in the body of Christ. What is that? Look at verse 12. So he gives all those people, pastors and teachers, verse 12, to equip his people for works of service. So the job, I'm just going to use pastors and teachers here for the time being, the role of pastors and teachers in the body of Christ, their job is to prepare God's people. That's you for works of service. That's their job description given by God. Prepare, your, prepare God's people for works of service. Now the question is, why is that, job, that the job description? Why are they to prepare us for works of service? Again, verse 12, to equip people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So the purpose of God's people doing works of service is to build up the body of Christ. So God gives your pastors, God gives Will and Rob to prepare you for works of service. You do works of service in order to build up the body of Christ. In other words, the body of Christ, the church, is built through God's people serving, doing works of service. That, how, that is how the church is built. And what is the church being built towards? Again, verse 13, until we all reach unity. Unity in what? Verse th oh, sorry, verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That maturity being attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, or in the original, it's the, it's the measure of the perfection of Christ. That is, the, the, the goal is to reach a maturity that is like that of Jesus. That's where we as the church are heading to the perfection of Christ. If I can summarize it for you like this, it's unity in maturity in Christ. Unity in maturity in Christ. That's the goal of our building work. Our building work is our serving work. Look at me, verse 15. Instead, Speaking the truth in love, we will grow as a church to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, 
joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we are heading again, verse 15, towards the mature body of the Lord Jesus, who is the head. The body, of course, again, is the church. And verse 16, as we mature as the church, as we mature as Christ's body into the head, Christ is the one who holds it all together. Verse 16. But notice in verse 16 that the body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And the context of work here is works of service. He's making the same point, is he not? We grow up into Christ as we serve the body, his church. And so that is one of the essential reasons why you gather as a church. Yes, we gather around God's word. Yes, we gather to worship him corporately. But one of the other key essential reasons is to do our works of service, that the body of Christ may be built up. That is not an optional reason for meeting and gathering as God's people. It is an essential reason and you do those works of service so that we may all be built up until we all reach maturity in Christ. And notice that works of service or serving each other is not just for some of God's people. Actually, it's not even for most of God's people. It is for all of God's people. Verse 16 says, as each part does its work. Verse 7, remember, Jesus gives grace to each one of us. So there is a role to play for every single person when you gather together as God's people. And the challenge for us, given that that's an essential reason as to why we gather together, the challenge for us is to jump in and do it. To serve one another as we gather as God's people. And so the big question really is, every time you meet with God's people, every single time, what service are you doing to build up the body so that we may all reach unity in maturity in Christ? Every time you gather, because that's the body of Christ when you gather. And by the way, I'm not talking simply about going on rosters and being on a roster every Sunday. I'm not saying it excludes that either. But even if you're not rostered on at church to, I don't know, bring morning tea or supper or you're not rostered on for kids' church or music or reading the Bible or welcoming or whatever it is, it doesn't mean that you're not at church to serve. You are still at church to serve. Serving is doing whatever builds up God's people. And you don't have to be on a roster to build up God's people. Serving can be as simple and as significant as asking someone, how are you? And actually taking the time to hang around long enough to listen to what they have to say and really listen to what they have to say or to dig a little bit deeper when they give you a response. That's serving. That's building up the body. You don't need to be on a roster to ask someone how they are. Uh, it can be just looking for a new person. You don't have to be on a roster to look for a new person who walks on the, in the door on a Sunday or comes into your youth group or to a Bible study group or something like that. It can be as simple as spotting a new person and just going, going and sitting next to them, even if it means not sitting in your favourite seat at church. That's building the body, but just by sitting next to a new person saying, Hi, I'm Fred. What's your name? It's building. That's serving. Uh, serving is for everyone, every week, every time we gather, big or small groups, every conversation. 
Every conversation you can have can be about building if you're seeking to encourage another person. That is building. Uh, 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 and serving as well, not just Sundays. Uh, you know, church in the Bible is not a verb. Church in the Bible is a noun. Anyone know, everyone know the difference between nouns and verbs? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand. A verb is a doing word. A doing word. But church in the Bible is never a doing word, although church is something that we do do. Church is a noun. A noun is a, like a, a, a being word. It's the people of God that are the church. And you're still part of the church even when you go home today. You're still part of church. And so serving is not necessarily just on Sundays during the service or when you're in the building at uh, Cabramatta. It might be inviting someone over for dinner or saying to someone, hey, let's go out for a meal so we can have a chat, so we can encourage each other and pray for, 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 for one another. Serving might be, might be looking after someone's kids for an afternoon or a night just so that they, the parents can go and have a rest. Serving might be, uh, for married people, just asking a couple of single people over for a meal and seeing how they're doing. Might be shopping for an elderly person or someone who is sick. Might be mowing someone's lawn. There are many ways we can serve and it doesn't have to just be on a Sunday. You know, sometimes we can turn up to church. I'm just going to talk about Sundays now, but I, you know, this can apply in other circumstances where we gather. But sometimes we can come to church with a I will be served today attitude, can't we? You know, in those questions that I asked you at the start, why do you go to church? What's the point of you being there? Uh, if you did not think as one of your responses I go to church to serve my brothers and sisters. That's why I go. Uh, then without even knowing it, without even realising it, you may have a, I'll be served today, thank you very much, when you turn up on a Sunday. You might just have that mindset and it might be completely in your subconscious. That is, sometimes you might treat church like it's a restaurant. I love going to restaurants. And when I say restaurant, look, I'm not talking about fur in Cabramatta. <laughs> but you know the restaurants you go to where, you know, there might be some nice, gentle, elevated music going on as you walk in the door. This quiet and peaceful environment. The lights are slightly low. And you can just, when you go to a restaurant, you just go where you want. You can just go when you want. And when you go to a restaurant, you expect everything to be ready when you arrive, don't you? Your table, the cutlery all nicely set out, nicely folded serviette, menus. That's what you expect when you go to a restaurant. And you expect the restaurant to be clean, don't you? I mean, you don't want to stay if it's a festy looking restaurant or you've got a little bit of food in the, your fork or your cutlery. You expect a restaurant to be clean. And I'm sure this will uh, resonate with all of you. When you go to a restaurant, you want value for money, don't you? And if there's something that you don't like at a restaurant, well, you'll complain and you'll expect someone else to fix it. You've gone to the restaurant. You expect someone else to fix it if there's something you don't like. And you know, if you're not satisfied, you can just leave. Or if you don't like it, you just don't go back. But you go to a restaurant to be served. You don't just go for the nice food, you go to be served. Church can be like that, can't it? We can church, treat church the same way, can't we? You just go where and when you want to go. You just turn up when you feel ready to turn up. And you expect everything to be ready when you arrive at church, don't you? 
You want all the chairs to be set up and the music team ready to go and the equipment and the microphones ready and the lights working. Expect the food to be there ready after, after you've finished. And you expect it to be clean. No one wants to walk into a church and there's stuff all over the floor. You walk into a church, stuff all over the floor, you go, oh, that's disgusting. Who left all that stuff on the floor waiting someone to clean them up? It must have been youth group on Friday night. <laughs> and you want value for money when you go to church, don't you? You do. You want value for all the money that you're going to give. Better be a good sermon. Better sing the songs that I like to sing. And if there is something you don't like at church, you'll complain and you'll expect someone else to fix it. You know, someone once came up to me at church and said, there is no toilet. (laughs) There There is no toilet paper in the toilet. And just walks off. Are you serious? People complain and just expect someone else to fix it. And if you're not satisfied, you can just leave. Don't come back. But you go to church expecting to be served. I wonder if you treat church like a restaurant sometimes. You might not be conscious of it when you turn up. But if you don't go consciously thinking, I'm here to serve, then you are treating church like a restaurant. Having said all that, I think we should treat church like a restaurant. Except we are the waiters and the waitresses, not the ones to be waited on. And waiters serve. That is their role. And waiters serve all the time. And every time they go to the restaurant. A waiter doesn't turn up at the restaurant and say, I don't think I'll serve today. Or a waiter doesn't go to a restaurant and halfway through goes, okay, your turn to serve me now. No. The reason a waiter turns up at church is to serve. And we are all waiters at church. Servants serving Always. Because when you're serving, you are building God's people. And that's what we are called to do. That's, what, that's part of what living a life worthy of your calling is all about. To build the church is to serve the church. And to serve the church, that it be united, well, you better be patient and gentle and forbearing and humble because there will be plenty of people who come to church expecting to be served. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying they'll be there. And that's okay. That's okay, as long as you're not one of them. But that's okay because that's what Jesus did for us. He served us uh, when we were his enemies. Served us when we were sinners. And you know, someone once said to me, you don't really know if you're serving as a servant until someone treats you like one. Keep serving God's people. Now, as I finish up, I just want to say something to those of you here today who feel like you do serve a lot and you've served week after week, month after month, year after year, and you even feel tired, maybe even exhausted, maybe nearly burnt out serving. And some of you, as you serve and serve a lot, may feel unappreciated. 
Uh, I want to say two things to you. Firstly, I want to say thank you for serving, but keep going. Tired, yes. Unappreciated, maybe. But I want to say keep going. I'm not saying, you know, burn yourself out or anything like that. I'm saying keep going. Keep serving. Because that is what you're called to do as one of God's people. And it's okay to be tired serving. But keep serving. Now that doesn't mean, like I said, that you burn yourself out. It may mean that you don't do a particular ministry that you feel like is burning you out, maybe taking a break from that. But don't take a break from serving. Serve differently. Serve differently and maybe speak to your pastors about that. But I want to say, no matter how tired you feel, keep serving. Maybe just differently so that you can keep going for the long haul. But secondly, I want to say to you, if you are feeling unappreciated, no matter how much you do, no matter how unappreciated you feel, keep remembering that you are serving God first. Okay? You are serving God first. And ultimately we play to that audience, the audience of one. Our Father in heaven, keep serving. But finally, I want to say to those of you here who may be, so I don't know all of you personally and those I've met, I've, I've just met, so I don't really know. So I'm not aiming this at anyone in particular. But if it applies to you, let it do so. But I finally want to say to those who are just too busy to serve, if you've just got too much on, or you're just too busy to serve, may I dare say gently but firmly that maybe if you're too busy to serve, you may not have understood the gospel or the implications of the gospel properly. You are saved into a family. You are saved into a body. You are saved into a community. You are saved into, if you like, a gospel restaurant. You are saved into a church. And part of your role as a person saved by God is to serve her, the church, Christ's bride. If you do not get that, you may not get Jesus. You may not quite understand what he's about. You remember Jesus, don't you? The head of the church, the one who came not to, serve, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Serving was good enough for Jesus. How arrogant it may be to think that our busyness is more important than his. That Jesus would serve and continue to serve. And you haven't the time nor the inclination. If you are too busy to serve, you need to think about how you can get unbusy, make hard decisions, unselfish decisions and build your church because if you are not serving you are not building we've talked about churches and restaurants but some people also think of church as a cruise ship don't they you know you get on your deck chair you have someone bring you a drink in a pineapple with one of those little umbrellas and that kind of thing. The church is a boat. It's not a cruise ship. It's a rowboat. In fact, it's one of those dragon boats, isn't it? In a dragon boat, everyone has an oar, except the person steering it, which is the Lord Jesus. 
Everyone else has an all. The question is, are you using it? Are you using it? If you're not using it, then you're just going along for the ride while everybody's frantically rowing and you know, you're just along with the ride with your foot dangling in the water while everyone else strains and struggles. And what they're doing is their part and yours. If you are not a help, you're a hindrance. There are no passengers in the body of Christ. And for the body of Christ to, to grow and to mature, each part must do its work. Are you doing yours? You are Christ's church. His church is the church of all nations. And his church is the church that serves. Let me pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many and for us. Father, you have called us to serve. May we follow Christ's example. And we pray this in his name. Amen.